And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. We turn now to the longtime senior staffer at an anti-Muslim think tank who's been named by National Security Advisor John Bolton as his new chief of staff. Fred Flights formerly served as Bolton's Under Secretary of State in the George W. Bush administration. He now joins the Trump administration from the Center for Security Policy, a think tank founded by former Reagan administration official Frank Gaffney. The Southern Poverty Law Center designated the organization an anti-Muslim extremist group saying its main focus is, quote, demonizing Islam and Muslims under the guise of national security. Statements from Frank Gaffney and other CSP staffers, along with claims made in CSP publications, have become increasingly conspiratorial in nature, making such claims as Muslims are attempting to overthrow the U.S. government from within and that Sharia law is trumping the Constitution in American courts. After last year's London Bridge terror attack that killed eight Eight people, Flight said the failure of British Muslims to assimilate was partially to blame for Islamic radicalism. In an interview on Breitbart News Daily, Flights was asked about other religious communities in the United States who've also not assimilated. It's certainly true there are some communities in the United States that have not assimilated. I'm not concerned about Amish or Jewish communities, but I will tell you that there are enclaves of Muslim communities in Michigan and Minnesota. That concern me. We know that in Minnesota there's a rising rate of measles because the community has not assimilated into the rest of the community and is not vaccinating their children. This is wrong. This is a big problem. The, the, the problem with these Muslim communities is that it is making them susceptible to this radical worldview that wants to destroy modern society, create a global caliphate, and, in, and in, impose Sharia law on uh, everyone on earth. Fred Flights is also the author of the 2016 book Obama Bomb, a dangerous and growing national security fraud, in which Flights wrote, quote, the most intellectually honest way for a future U.S. president to deal with the nuclear agreement with Iran is to tear it up on his first day in office. Civil rights groups condemn Flights's appointment, and the group Muslim Advocates issued a statement that, quote, the White House continues to be the nation's central organizing body for white supremacists. For more, we're joined by Eric Levitz, associate editor for New York Magazine's Daily Intelligencer, whose latest piece is headlined, Bolton Installs Anti-Muslim Wingnut as NSC Chief of Staff. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Eric. Yeah, thanks, Why don't you just lay out who Fred Flights is, um, this man that John Bolton has just appointed as his chief of staff? Sure. Well, Flights and Bolton uh, go back many decades. So uh, they actually did a little bit of work together under the first Bush administration uh, when uh, Flights uh, assisted him with intelligence. And then under the second Bush administration, Flights was Bolton's chief of staff. Um, and in that role, he was kind of known as Bolton's enforcer. When they got into conflicts with the career staff at the State Department and CIA, flights would fight for Bolton's point of view. And this is when Bolton worked for worked under George under W. George Bush. Under George W. Bush, yes. And talk about some of the controversies that flights was then and has since been involved with. Sure. Well, uh, in, in that particular period, one a special point of contention was that Bolton wanted to give this speech about Cuba uh, pursuing biological weapons, and he had very belligerent language that he wanted to convey this point in that uh, put off uh, analysts at the CIA, at the State Department. They did not feel uh, either that intelligence supported what Bolton wanted to say or that it would be diplomatically wise for him to say what he wished to. Um, and the controversy over this got so intense that uh, in flights was so uh, forceful in advocating Bolton's view that uh, one of the career staff, um, Christian Westerman, in an email that was later disclosed, said that that flights was having an effect on his his health and well-being and uh, interest in serving in government. Um, and this is, you know, especially relevant given that the Trump administration has these conflicts with the so-called deep state, um, and bringing in flights uh, suggests that you know they're they're going to escalate those conflicts. And also, in 2011, uh, he insisted against the uh, uh, the position of 16 or 17 intelligence agencies, U.S. Uh, national security agencies, that Iran was, in fact, on the cusp uh, of getting a, a, a nuclear uh, weapon. And this is especially relevant, since he's said multiple times uh, that Trump should tear up the agreement as soon as he's in office. 
Uh, yep, yeah, and uh, Fleiss has spent a lot of the past couple of years, he has a column in the National Review, and, and almost every single column is about, uh, you know, Trump, please get around to killing the steel now. Um, you know, uh, so he's, he's very intensely anti-Iran. He really, he shares all the pillars of John Bolton's worldview on foreign policy. Well, let's go to John Bolton speaking on Fox News in uh, 2015. Ambassador, you've written an op-ed today in The New York Times, and here's the headline. It's an eye-catcher. To stop Iran's bomb, bomb Iran. What do you mean? Well, the negotiations, whether they lead to an agreement or not, are not going to stop Iran from getting nuclear weapons. They're so far advanced now, the concessions they've made are so trivial and easily reversible that the deal actually legitimizes Iran's existing nuclear program. So my conclusion is not a happy one, but given that if Iran gets nuclear weapons, so will Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, and maybe others, that just as Israel twice before has struck nuclear weapons programs in the hands of hostile states, I'm afraid, given the circumstances, that's the only real option open to us now. So that's John Bolton speaking in 2015, saying that uh, Iran should be bombed. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he shares that opinion with, uh, I, I believe, Mike Pompeo, the, the new secretary of state, has voiced similar views. And, and we can be confident that Flights is no less uh, reluctant to use military force uh, against Iran or, or any other American adversary. Lights, you also write, or until he was just tapped, is senior vice president at Frank Gaffney's Center for Security Policy, an Islamophobic think tank. Talk about the things he has called for during that time, I mean, or what the think tank has called for. Yeah. So, uh, you know, like Bolton, Bolton also actually uh, entered government from the Gatestone Institute, which is also an anti-Muslim think tank. And both of them are less flamboyantly Islamophobic than the institutions they are working for, but they've been happy to collect paychecks from them. And uh, the Center for Security Policy, its core belief is that uh, Islam is not a religion. It should not be protected by the First Amendment because it is actually a totalitarian political ideology. And they are uh, sort of self-identified neo-McCarthyite. They want, uh, they believe that the, so they believe that about 80 percent of mosques in the U.S. and all prominent American Muslim uh, organizations are front groups for the Muslim Brotherhood, an international Islamist organization that wants to uh, take over the United States. And it, it's very, it's a, uh, the analogy is drawn directly from Soviet communism. And they believe that the Muslim Brotherhood has infiltrated the highest levels of Correct. US and government. we need a new House on American Activities Committee to suss out the, the Muslim Brotherhood infiltrators. Um, they've talked about that less now that Trump is in office, but when, when the Obama administration was in power, Power, it was it was really imperative to get the Muslim Brotherhood calling out calling for an investigation of the Islamist fifth column in this country. Correct. Well, Gaffney, the head of this uh, organization, was once banned uh, uh, from CPAC, the Conservative Political Action uh, uh, Conference. And in fact, it was uh, John Bolton who intervened and had that ban lifted uh, on Gaffney. Can you explain what happened? Correct. Yeah, sort of, again, like the, the McCarthyites, eventually they started uh, shooting at targets that mattered even to their own coalition. So uh, in, um, I believe, 2011, uh, Gaffney accused both a, a Muslim uh, conservative uh, member of the American Conservative Union and Grover Norquist of being uh, abettors of the Muslim Brotherhood takeover, ostensibly because Norquist's wife is Palestinian-American. I'm not sure if there was any other basis beyond that. Um, and the, the reaction was to uh, informally pass this resolution that Gaffney was not allowed to speak at CPAC in 2016. Um, after Trump's campaign really sort of changed uh, the way that the conservative movement thought about uh, the bounds of acceptability on Islamophobia and anti-Muslim bias, Bolton um, personally intervened, according to reports from The Atlantic, uh, to have uh, Gaffney's ban from CPAC. Uh, lifted, and Gaffney has spoken at the last, I think, three uh, conservative political action conferences. Let's go back to June 2013, two months after the Boston Marathon bombing. Then Congress member Mike Pompeo erroneously claimed Muslim groups had not condemned the attack. Just under two months since the attacks in Boston, and in those intervening weeks, the silence of Muslim leaders has been deafening. One of the most devastating terrorist attacks on America in the last 20 years come overwhelmingly from people of a single faith and are performed in the name of that faith, a special obligation falls on those that are the leaders of that faith. Silence has made these Islamic leaders across America potentially complicit in these acts. If a religion claims to be one of peace, Mr. Speaker, its leaders must reject violence that is perpetrated in its name.
A day after Congressman Pompeo gave those remarks, the Council on American Islamic Relations wrote to him demanding an apology. CARE and a number of other major Muslim organizations had, in fact, condemned the marathon bombings, many within hours of the attack, and organized blood drives and other relief efforts in Boston. Pompeo never apologized or responded to the letter from CARE, of course, Pompeo, now the secretary of state. Um, if you can talk about, you know, this era now that we're talking about, John Bolton comes in immediately, Trump pulls out of the Iran nuclear deal, uh, then goes on to cancel the summit with North Korea. Um, you write that in March of this year, Flights published a book titled The Coming North Korea Nuclear Nightmare, What Trump Must Do to Reverse Obama's Strategic Patience. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, predictably, it seems like Flights and Bolton are on the same page on North Korea. And, you know, Bolton has specifically suggested that uh, negotiations with North Korea are not worth really pursuing, that the, it's good that Trump and Kim are meeting personally, because then we can have the highest possible level diplomatic effort fail and proceed to bombing North Korea. Um, and Flights' position seems pretty similar. Well, Bolton is, in fact, the third uh, uh, head of the National Security Council under the Trump administration. Could you say a little about his predecessors, uh, in particular uh, Michael Flynn, and the positions that they've taken uh, on Islam and on Muslims in general? Sure, yeah. So, arguably, one of the scariest things about the Trump administration when it first took power was the fact that Michael Flynn was in charge of the National Security Council. Uh, Flynn was a, you know, intelligence operative of, for many years, but he took a turn. Uh, uh, after he left the Obama administration, and he was a, a rabid conspiratorial uh, Islamophobe. He felt that the he, he said that the Florida Democratic Party was trying to install Sharia law uh, in the Sunshine State. He suggested that there were billboards uh, lining the southern border of the United States with messages to ISIS, uh, telling them where the border was weak so that they could come in. And he brought with him uh, people of similar frame of mind. And so the National Security Council under Flynn uh, did things such as uh, compose this memo that suggested uh, that the detailed this elaborate conspiracy between establishment Republicans, globalist bankers. Uh, Islamists and Marxists to take down President Trump because they recognized him as an existential threat to cultural Marxist memes. So this was the kind of uh, national security policy that was being formulated under Flynn. I mean, they were doing other stuff, but, but wacky stuff was happening. H.R. McMaster came in. He's much more conventionally hawkish. He cleared out the, 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 the crazies. And now uh, McMaster is gone, Bolton's in, and he's bringing in, he's reshaping the National Security Council in his image, and we're going to get, you know, a more intensely hawkish uh, and more Islamophobic. Uh. Well, you've, you've compared the response that Democratic Congress member Keith Ellison received for his previous association associations with the Nation of Islam when he was running for DNC chair, and the response that these Islamic, uh, Islamophobic, presently Islamophobic figures have uh, received as they've been appointed in the Trump administration. So could you talk about yeah, that sure. discrepancy? I think that this is just really very well illustrates the fact that we are live in a country where bigotry against Muslims is fundamentally seen as acceptable. Um, so Keith Ellison, when he was running for DNC chair, he was a congressman from Minnesota who had uh, decades ago, had a relationship with Louis Farrakhan's uh, organization. In 2006, he had uh, uh, denounced Louis Farrakhan, had denounced anti-Semitism and bigotry, had no relationship with it for uh, a decade. Um, and he had also spent most of the past year campaigning for a Jewish uh, candidate for president. Nonetheless, none of this uh, absolved the fact that he had once had a relationship with an anti-Semite and he needed to release a statement clarifying that he does not believe in this and that it was a, the subject of controversy. New York Times columnists wrote articles about, you know, are, are Democrats, uh, do they have their own hateful populism within their tent? Um, so then you have Bolton and Flights, and the, the strongest defense you can make for either of these men is that they haven't been as Islamophobic as the organizations that they represent. And yet that didn't apply in Ellison's case. Uh, and, you know, you have these people who are currently uh, members of anti-Islamic groups have never denounced the views of those institutions, in fact, defend those institutions uh, very vociferously, and have, on occasion, made uh, anti-Islamic remarks themselves. And this was barely a subject of conversation when they uh, were appointed uh, to the administration. Well, Eric Levitz, want to thank you for being with us, associate editor for The New York Magazine's Daily Intent Intelligencer. We'll link to your piece, Bolton installs anti-Muslim wingnut as NSC chief of staff. When we come back, we go to Gaza and to Amsterdam. Amsterdam, to look at the Gaza flotillas, the boats that are challenging Israel's embargo of Gaza and what's happened to them. Stay with us.